this cell block home are all sentenced to die. My sister, Carrie Lynn Dalton, was convicted of capital crime. I'd watched a complete farce from beginning to end come to its conclusion. A little over five years mm -hmm. here. All right, but I've been in prison nine years. Really um, affected me, so let me pull myself together a moment. And how do you spend your days now? I exercise, I read, I study. Crime and murder details. On June 26, 1988, a horrifying and gruesome murder occurred at a mobile home park in Live Oak Springs, California, forever altering the lives of those involved. The victim, Irene Louise May, tragically lost her life in a vicious act of violence driven by a dispute over stolen jewelry. The primary perpetrator of the heinous crime was Kerry Lynn Dalton, who firmly believed that Irene May had stolen her precious jewelry. Fueled by anger and a desire for revenge, Dalton enlisted the help of three accomplices, Mark Lee Tompkins, Cheryl Ann Baker, and an unidentified individual referred to as George. Together, they embarked on a brutal campaign of torture that ultimately led to May's untimely death. The events of that fateful day would forever be etched in the minds of those who investigated the case. The group subjected May to a nightmarish ordeal that defied all notions of humanity. Armed with a cast iron frying pan, a knife, and a syringe filled with battery acid, they sought to inflict unimaginable pain on their victim. The torture involved a barrage of merciless beatings, multiple stabbings, and the administration of electric shocks, leaving May in excruciating agony. Throughout the ordeal, May's pleas for mercy fell on deaf ears as her tormentors continued to inflict suffering without remorse. The cruelty and brutality displayed during the torture were beyond comprehension, leading many to wonder how such atrocities could be committed by fellow human beings. This cell block home are all sentenced to die. They're on death row for a pretty good reason. Uh, they've. So the women in this one little area seem so normal like everybody i they can be the nicest person but i have that in the back of the head that they have that potential basically live like the general prison population yes. just confined in within this area, area. Yes. but this is it this is their this world is it. can i just start by asking you how long you've been here i've been on the road a little over five years Despite extensive investigations by law enforcement, May's body was never recovered. The lack of a physical body presented a significant challenge to the investigators and later the prosecution. The absence of tangible evidence made it difficult to conclusively establish the full extent of the violence and the exact circumstances surrounding her death. This absence also left May's family without the closure that comes from a proper burial and farewell to their loved one. The investigation into the crime and the subsequent trial painted a chilling picture of the individuals responsible for this heinous act. Carrie Lynn Dalton and her accomplices face a justice system seeking answers and accountability for the unspeakable horror inflicted on Irene May. The trial proceedings were emotionally charged as the prosecution presented harrowing details of the torture and the defense sought to challenge the credibility of the evidence. The trial's outcome was a pivotal moment for the victim's families and the community as justice was sought for the grievous loss of Irene May's life. After a thorough examination of the evidence and a painful deliberation process, the jury found Carrie Lynn Dalton guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and murder. The jury also determined that two special circumstances were present, intentional killing while lying in wait and intentional killing involving the infliction of torture. As a consequence of the jury's decision, Carrie Lynn Dalton was sentenced to death by lethal injection. The severity of the sentence reflected the gravity of the crime and the desire for justice on behalf of the victim and her loved ones. However, the case would continue to be a matter of legal contention and public debate in the years that followed. Despite the conviction and sentencing, the case would take unexpected twists and turns during the appeals process. 
Legal challenges raise concerns about the validity of certain charges and evidence presented during the trial. The Supreme Court of California would eventually weigh in on the case, making significant determinations that impacted Dalton's sentence. The unresolved nature of Irene May's disappearance, coupled with the evolving legal developments, left a lasting impact on those involved in the case and the broader community. It serves as a reminder of the devastating consequences that violence and cruelty can bring to the lives of individuals and their families. The memory of Irene Lewis May continues to be honored by those seeking justice and closure, while the events of that dreadful day stand as a stark reminder of the importance of upholding the principles of justice and compassion in society. Accomplices and Weapons Used the murder of Irene Louise May was not the sole work of Carrie Lynn Dalton. She had a group of three individuals assisting her in carrying out his horrifying act. Among them were Mark Lee Tompkins and Cheryl Ann Baker, who actively participated in the torture and killing of May. Additionally, there was a mysterious individual only referred to as George, whose identity remained undisclosed, yet he was allegedly involved in the crime. Mark Lee Tompkins played a prominent role in inflicting physical harm on the victim. His actions were central to the torture that Irene May endured. During the gruesome ordeal, Tompkins wielded a cast iron frying pan, a weapon that in hands of a merciless perpetrator became a tool of violence and devastation. The pan's heavy and solid nature made it a terrifying instrument capable of causing significant injuries and pain. Cheryl Ann Baker, Another active accomplice participated in torture and killing, amplifying May's suffering. Her involvement in the crime added another dimension of brutality to the already horrifying act. Baker, like Tompkins, contributed to the violence with an equally menacing weapon, a knife. This sharp and deadly instrument was used to stab the defenseless victim multiple times, further intensifying the anguish infliction upon her. In addition to the cast iron frying pan and knife, the group employed a syringe filled with battery acid to administer electric shocks to Irene May. A little over five years mm -hmm. here. Right, but I've been in prison nine years. I'm pretty mad a lot of the time. Most pretty of the mad? Time. Mm -hmm. Mad at who? I think because I have an extensive criminal history, because I'm a drug addict because I admit that I'm a drug addict, because I've been an outlaw most of my life, you know, but I'm not guilty of this crime. So as far as throwing my life away and spending my life in prison. Do you have feelings of regret? Definitely. Or remorse for all the things Definitely. you did that all? I'm sorry for my whole life, I am. I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm proud of the things I've done. I'm very ashamed. I don't mean some angel, poor innocent, picked up out of society. My life took me here. This sinister method of torture aimed to inflict pain and fear as the acid would cause excruciating burns and tissue damage upon contact with May's skin. The use of such a vile and malicious tactic exemplified the utter lack of compassion and humanity displayed by the perpetrators. The combination of these weapons, chosen with deliberate intent to maximize suffering, created a nightmarish scene of torture and violence. The act of barbarity unleashed upon Irene May was marked by its sadistic nature, leaving her with no chance of escape or survival. The motivations behind the choice of weapons and the willingness of Dalton's accomplices to participate in such cruelty remain subjects of speculation and horror. The heinous acts committed by this group defy rational understanding and remind society of dark depths human beings can descend to when driven by rage revenge, or malevolence. As the investigation and trial unfolded, the role of each accomplice and their specific contributions to the crime were meticulously scrutinized. The collective responsibility of these individuals was pivotal in securing justice for the victim and her family. The tragic tale of Irene Louise May serves as a summer reminder of the importance of seeking justice for victims of such unfathomable acts and ensuring that those responsible are held accountable. The legacy of this crime echoes through the annals of the criminal justice system, making it a poignant and heart-wrenching chapter in the quest for truth, closure, and a society free from such cruelty. Arrest and Trial 
The investigation into the murder of Irene Lewis May was meticulously exhaustive, leading law enforcement to carry Lynn Dalton as the primary suspect. On May 14, 1992, authorities arrested Dalton in connection with a heinous crime that had taken place at the Mobile Home Park in Live Oak Springs, California. The arrest marked a critical turning point in the pursuit of justice for the victim and her family. Subsequently, the trial for the murder of Irene May commenced on February 14, 1995, under the jurisdiction of the presiding judge, Thomas J. Wellen. The trial proceedings were emotionally charged as the gravity of the crime weighed heavily on the courtroom. Through the trial, the judge and the legal teams grappled with several complex and challenging aspects of the case. A significant hurdle for the prosecution was the absence of Irene May's body, which made it difficult to establish the full extent of the violence perpetrated against her. The lack of a physical body created a unique legal scenario, requiring the prosecution to rely heavily on circumstantial evidence to build their case. The conflicting circumstantial evidence surrounding the case further complicated matters. The defense raised questions regarding the credibility of certain testimonies and the reliability of evidence challenging the prosecution's version of events. The absence of a crime scene and direct evidence combined with the conflicting narratives presented by witnesses made it challenging for the jury to arrive at a conclusion, understanding of the events that transpired on that tragic day. During the trial, there were allegations of confessions made by Karen Lynn Dalton. However, these alleged confessions were based on hearsay as there was no direct admission from Dalton herself. My sister, Carrie Lynn Dalton, was convicted of capital crime. Any physical evidence without a crime scene and without anyone being declared deceased nearly. The task force wanted him to because he said he testified that he spoke with her uh, nearly a month after what they were drinking, where they were at, and even though the police threatened him um, with testimony, he knows that he saw his wife. So the um, Police actually got San Diego Superior County Courthouse is where they keep the transcripts and her trial transcript on this film um, and with the very deep hopes that folks will want. Life on death row is really, really bad for you emotionally, physically, mentally. The defense contested the validity of these alleged confessions, highlighting the possibility of misinterpretation or manipulation of the statements. As the trial progressed, the courtroom bore witness to the harrowing testimonies of witnesses who provided first-hand accounts of the nightmarish torture inflicted upon Irene May. These testimonies painted a chilling picture of the cruelty and brutality that characterized the crime, leaving those in the courtroom in disbelief and horror. The defense, in contrast, sought to challenge the credibility of the prosecution's evidence and witnesses. They presented alternative theories and explanations to cast doubt on the guilt of Carrie Lynn Dalton and her alleged accomplices. Throughout the proceedings, the jury was faced with a difficult task of sifting through the conflicting narratives and determining the truth amidst a sea of uncertainty. As the trial drew to a close, the judge, Thomas J. Wellen, acknowledged the challenges posed by the absence of Irene May's body and the conflicting circumstantial evidence. He emphasized the importance of establishing the corpus delicti in such cases, a legal requirement that mandates proving the occurrence of a crime before a person can be convicted. Ultimately, the jury was tasked with considering the evidence presented by both the prosecution and the defense, weighing the credibility of witnesses and deliberating on the guilt or innocence of the accused. The fate of Carrie Lynn Dalton and her alleged accomplices rested in the hands of the jurors, who bore the immense responsibility of delivering justice for the tragic loss of Irene May's life. As the trial concluded and the verdict was reached, the impact of the crime continued to reverberate through the courtroom and beyond. The pursuit of justice for Irene May had taken its course, but the impact of her untimely death would forever remain etched in the hearts of her loved ones and the collective memory of those affected by this brutal act of violence. Conviction and Sentencing 
The trial of Carrie Lynn Dalton for the murder of Irene Louise May had been a challenging and emotionally charged ordeal lasting several weeks. As the proceedings came to an end, the moment of truth arrived for the jury who held the weighty responsibility of determining Dalton's guilt or innocence. After careful considering the evidence presented by both the prosecution and the defense, the jury reached a verdict. Really um, affected me, so let me pull myself together a moment. Let me start with this that will help me get back on balance here. Slide easily from the Honorable Judge Thomas J. Whalen's lips. The meticulously groomed silver-haired man his melodramatic words followed the pronouncement that he was upholding the sentence. I'd watched a complete farce from beginning to end come to its conclusion. There were no checks and balances in place to ensure justice was served for all. This could happen to anyone so far removed from the average person's life concerns and interests. Its insignificance affords it little often. It will be revealed that our justice system does not always work. The defense sought to present mitigating factors, shedding light on Dalton's troubled past and arguing for the possibility of redemption and rehabilitation. On the other hand, the prosecution emphasized the severity of the crime and the necessity of holding the perpetrators accountable through the most stringent punishment available under the law. Ultimately, the jury rendered its decision. On May 23, 1995, they sentenced Carrie Lynn Dalton to death by lethal injection. The announcement of the death penalty sentence elicited mixed reactions from those present in the courtroom. While some found solace in the notion of justice being served, others grappled with the moral complexities and ethical dilemmas surrounding capital punishment. The conviction of sentencing of Carrie Lynn Dalton drew considerable attention to the controversial aspect of the case. The absence of Irene May's body and direct evidence presented significant challenges during the trial. The reliance on circumstantial evidence, while compelling, raised questions about the reliability and sufficiency of such proof in securing a conviction for a crime as heinous as this. The death penalty sentence further ignited public debate on the appropriateness and efficacy of capital punishment as a means of justice. The case of Irene May and the subsequent legal proceedings raised broader questions about the criminal justice system, the pursuit of truth, and the complexities of delivering justice in the face of such unimaginable violence. As Carrie Lynn Dalton awaited her fate on death row, the impact of her actions continued to resonate deeply with those affected by the tragedy. Irene May's family grappled with their grief and their enduring absence of closure, while the community reflected on the consequences of such brutality. The case of Carrie Lynn Dalton served as a haunting reminder of the dark depths to which humanity could descend and the indelible scars left by acts of violence on the fabric of society. Jillian's Perspective as the Victim's Daughter Jillian Hansard's perspective on the murder of her mother, Irene May, is deeply personal and laced with painful memories. At the time of the tragic event, Jillian was merely five years old, too young to fully comprehend the gravity of the situation unfolding around her. Nevertheless, the impact of her mother's untimely death would leave an indelible mark on her life. Jillian's recollection of her mother were a mix of personal memories and stories shared by others. She vividly recalls the struggles her mother faced with drug addiction, a battle that would often leave her absent and unable to fulfill the responsibilities of motherhood. At just a tender age, Jillian found herself and her younger brothers left to fend for themselves in a world rife with uncertainty and chaos. During these tumultuous times, Jillian and her brothers often found themselves hiding in their bedroom, seeking refuge from the unpredictability that surrounded them. Her journey from a challenging childhood to a stable adulthood stands as a testament to the power of love and strength of the human spirit to overcome adversity. Jillian's perspective as the victim's daughter is a poignant reminder of the lasting impact that violence and tragedy can have on the lives of those left behind. Her story serves as a call to society to prioritize compassion, 
support and empathy for those who have endured such profound loss, helping them find healing and hope amidst the darkness. Carrie Lynn Dalton's Perspective A Prison Pen Pal Letter In a poignant prison pen pal letter, Carrie Lynn Dalton attempts to shed light on her perspective, acknowledging the gravity of her situation while presenting herself in a new light. As a resident of death row, Dalton grapples with the reality of her conviction for a murder that lacks a body, weapons, or a crime scene. She claims to have experienced a profound change, one that has brought forth a newfound respect for all things and all people. Her life on death row has offered her a unique perspective on humanity, instilling in her a deep understanding of the value of honesty and truthfulness. The act of reaching out through letter writing represents a crucial aspect of Dalton's desire to connect with others. While locked away from the outside world, she seeks to forge connections through the written word, finding solace and companionship in the art of correspondence. All the way to the bottom to say, wait a minute, man, this ain't right. And now, how do you spend your days now? I exercise, I read, I study. I try not to think because if I think too hard, I hate myself. You have a tiny self. That's it for you. And I see the cage and I just, oh, I don't want to blow up. How would you feel if you woke up and, and seen your thing? But I brought myself there, like you said. Do you have contact with your family? Yeah, I do. Has your mom ever come to visit you? She came every week until I came to death row. She can't. And I don't want to talk about them because I don't want them involved in it. Yeah, I understand that thought, but what are your thoughts about being executed? That's not the bad part. The act of sharing her thoughts and feelings with others becomes a lifeline for Dalton, a way to navigate the isolation and darkness that pervades her life on death row. Acknowledging the serious nature of her situation, Dalton does not shy away from the weight of her crimes. However, she endeavors to find moments of joy and laughter amidst the desolation. Her quest to smile and laugh reflects a resilient spirit and unwillingness to succumb entirely to the darkness of her circumstances. The ability to find moments of levity amidst the anguish demonstrates her resilience and determination to retain some semblance of humanity in the face of the abyss. In her letter, Dalton does not seek to downplay the gravity of her actions or the impact they have had on others. Instead, she aims to present a more nuanced and multifaceted portrayal of herself. The woman who once sought thrill and excitement now grapples with consequences of her choices, finding herself in a prison cell where remorse and introspection are her constant companions. For Carrie Lynn Dalton, the act of writing a prison pen pal letter represents more than mere correspondence. It becomes a testament to her humanity in the midst of a life marked by tragedy and incarceration. Her words carry the weight of remorse, the longing for connection, and the hope for redemption. Through the simple act of penning her thoughts, Dalton reveals a complex and multifaceted individual grappling with her past, present, and uncertain future. As the recipient of her letter reads her words, they are confronted with the sobering reality of life lived behind bars, a life irrevocably altered by choices made and the consequences that followed. Dalton's perspective, captured within the confines of the letter, serves as a stark reminder of the human capacity for both darkness and resilience, as well as the potential for transformation and redemption, even in the bleakest of circumstances. Conclusion in conclusion, the case of Carrie Lynn Dalton and the murder of Irene Louise May remains shrouded in darkness and uncertainty. Many distressing details have emerged over the course of the investigation and trial, painting a chilling picture of the heinous crime committed on that fateful day in June 1988. Though the body of Irene May has never been found, the confessions of two individuals involved in the murder suggest a horrifying fate with May's remains allegedly dismembered and scattered to prevent discovery. The tragic reality is that, without any trace of her for over three decades, it is highly likely that Irene Louise May lost her life on that ominous night. Amidst the turmoil of her own troubled past, Irene May had been striving to turn her life around, seeking redemption and rehabilitation 
while attending parenting classes to provide a better future for her two children. Despite the hardship she faced, she made sincere efforts to improve her circumstances and break free from the clutches of drug addiction. Carrie Lynn Dalton's conviction was reached amidst a sea of conflicting evidence and unanswered questions. Her criminal history in association with methamphetamine cast a shadow over her character, raising doubts about her innocence. Nevertheless, the lack of direct evidence, the absence of a body, and the reliance on the circumstantial proof have left lingering uncertainties about the veracity of the conviction. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.